we're continuing with our series on forcing storms to serve you. Now, I believe that God is doing, uh, God is using this. I don't believe that God uh, in any way is, is causing this to happen, but I believe that God is using this for his glory. And there's three things that I, I feel in my spirit. This is before I share some of the stuff that's on my heart. There's just three things that I feel are happening uh, uh, in the midst of all of this. Number one, I feel like God is using this to reveal himself to the world. Uh, we're just, there's an unprecedented amount of the, of, of the goodness of God being released uh, over the airwaves through technology and through connection in unique ways. And so it's never been, and now listen, it's never been easier to invite a friend to church. And perhaps you're here today joining us for this first time. Welcome. It's so good to have you with us. Email us at church at gatewayfamily.ca so that we can uh, uh, get in touch with you and welcome you to uh, uh, our, our church family and, and, and send some stuff to you so that you can, you know, engage who we are. So we're so glad that you would join us today, but it's never been easy. So be invitational. Those of you who are part of the Gateway Church family or perhaps you're, you know, tuning in from another church and, and you just need time to do that. By the way, if you are turning, tuning in from another church, make sure that you're sending your tithes and offerings to your home church. We don't want them. Send them to your home church and, and journey that way with your church family. But yeah, if you're joining us, it's never been easier to invite somebody to church. And so I want to encourage you to, to do that. Use this opportunity to invite them. And we're going to share the gospel every week. If you're tuning in today uh, for the first time, you're going to hear the gospel gospel. You're going to hear what Jesus has done for you and how you can respond to him. Secondly, I believe he's using this time to refine his church. Uh, it's, it's, there's, there's just, this is an unprecedented change uh, in the way that we're doing church, in the way that we're managing church family, but most of all, in the way that we're managing our own personal journeys. And now what God is doing is he's bringing, he's using this to bring us individually closer to his presence, closer to him, engaging him with intimacy and growing that way. And not only is there more content, you know, I mean, this is an unprecedented time where there's content available to you. Not only is there more content available to you, um, but there's more opportunity for you to engage that content and grow. And I want to encourage you to use this uh, as, as, as a chance to engage everything that's available for you and, and connect that way. And finally, it's, it, God is using this to reform our mission. He's, he's creating a, a, a change in the way that as, as, as believers we're stretching into the mission of heaven, which is to see miracles and signs and people saved. Revival always has the power of God revealed and the wonder of his grace and love released so that people can come into a saving knowledge of who he is, but not just through a message alone, but through experiencing his power and his grace. And so I want to encourage you uh, to, to engage those things. And one of the things that I'm, I'm really uh, noticing in this time is that God is using it to engage people's hearts so that uh, they're, they're learning how to be bigger. Smith, Smith Wigglesworth used to say, I am a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. <laughs> a thousand times bigger on the inside. What is that? Some of, you, some of you might, over the course of this time, have maybe become a little bigger uh, without the opportunity to go to your gyms and stuff. But at the end of the day, what God is doing is he's creating a people who are learning how to be bigger on the inside than on the outside. How to, and, and, and rather than having, I, I've always said here that we're supposed to be inside out believers. That, that what's going on on our insides affects our outsides, not the other way around. And I want to encourage you, use this time. Use it to grow in how you're managing your inner man and how you're growing in your inner man uh, so that you can grow that way. Now, listen. God doesn't play favorites. And this is really, really important that we understand this. God doesn't play favorites. So uh, it's not like he just decided that Billy Graham was going to be better than everybody else, that he liked Billy Graham more than everybody else, or other great leaders that we've experienced over the past. It's the same spirit. It's the same spirit that touches Every individual, it's the Holy Spirit that empowers us, that walks with us. God is three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And when Jesus left the earth, he said, it's good that I go because then I can send the helper, the Holy Spirit, the comforter. This is an uncomfortable time. And, you know, the reason his name is comfort, comforter is because there are going to be occasions when we're uncomfortable. But God in his grace has sent Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, to touch us so that we can be, uh, in a sense, plugged in to the supernatural nature of God in heaven. With that in mind, he doesn't play favorites. Rather, 
he leans into pouring his grace out in greater measure to those who have made God their favorite. Take a moment and let that sink in. God doesn't play favorites, but he's looking for those who have made him their favorite. And I think that there's a great, there's a great opportunity for us to learn this in this season and engage it. Well, now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to read a bit of scripture to you. Now, my screen has, has portions of it, but I'm going to read from Luke chapter 19, verse 41 through to 44, and it says this. And when he drew near, this is just a follow-up of what Pastor Amy read earlier at the beginning of the service. And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up barricades around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and your children with you, and they will not leave one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now let me give you some context to this scripture. Jesus has just uh, been brought into Jerusalem. As Pastor Amy shared earlier, the city is in uproar. We, we call this Palm Sunday because Jesus rode in on a donkey, on a colt actually, a donkey's colt. He rode in and people were waving palm branches and laying down their garments, receiving a king. This was, it was huge. This is important that you understand that. Jerusalem, the city, was receiving the king. And then Jesus, all of this is happening. You'd think that he'd be basking in the glow of this triumphant entry. Instead, he begins to weep. And he's weeping over Jerusalem. And he after, actually, he prophesies over Jerusalem, uh, the city itself. Forty years later, what Jesus said about the city being hemmed in and destroyed would happen by the Romans. So Jesus is looking at the city and he's saying, Oh, Jerusalem if you had only known the things that make for peace. The, the, the name Jerusalem, the, the word actually means the way of peace or the teachings of peace. First of all, number one, would that we would have known the ways that make for peace. Well, who is the way that makes for peace? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus was known as the Prince of Peace. That's what was prophesied or spoke about him before it ever happened. God revealed his nature to Isaiah the prophet, who referred to him as the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the prince of peace, the everlasting father. That's Jesus. Jesus is the way to peace. No matter what you're doing today, no matter how you're trying to find peace today, even perhaps you're watching and you've been medicating yourself through alcohol or through any form of subject, substance or, or even medicating yourself through entertainment to try to, to find find peace. Uh, there is no other way than through Christ. Christ is the way to peace. It's not about him setting you up and living a, a, a life that's full of rules. That's what religion is. Jesus wants to have a relationship with you that sets you free from the brokenness and the pain that you're experiencing right now. And that's what it means to be bigger on the inside than on the outside. You see, because when Christ comes into your life, he transforms what's going on inside of you and suddenly what's going on outside doesn't have the authority that it used to have anymore. That's the beauty of being connected to the king of peace, to the prince of peace. Now, Jesus did something unique here. When a king would come into a city, if the king rode on a war horse, he was coming to make war. If a king rode in on a donkey, he was coming to make peace. Jesus came into the city as the king, as the prince of peace. He wants to bring you peace. Peace that surpasses your understanding. In other words, it means that you're at peace even though it doesn't make sense. Even though everything around you is saying that you shouldn't be at peace, you can be at peace. Now, one of the things that sort of happens in a moment like this is that we don't really fully understand what it means to be hungry. It says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now last week, when Sammy and I were talking, and wasn't that fun, and it was fun to do the unplugged uh, church afterwards, and we're going to create more opportunities to do that over time. Um, but what I'd like to do is just come back to a point that I made in our conversation. It was this. I said last week that physically you and I are, are actually in just varying degrees of hunger. 
Whether we've, been, whether we've just finished a meal or whether we're, you know, pining for our next meal, we're actually just, our physical bodies are in varying degrees of hunger. That means that we, we, do, get, we do get filled, but we don't stay filled. We, re, we, re, we end up coming back to hunger. So we're in this scale of varying degrees of hunger. Now, this is important because one of the things that we don't understand is that often in our spirits, we're actually in the same sort of condition. In our inner man, we're in varying degrees of hunger. Now, this is important. Are you hungry? Physically, one of the signs of starvation is that your stomach muscle begins to atrophy. And because it begins to atrophy, you lose the sensation of hunger and you don't feel hungry any longer. Now, I would say this, and and I think some of you would agree, that many people in the church actually have lost their hunger. They've lost the perspective of what it means to be hungry before the Lord. They've actually stopped feeding their hunger. Because that's what you're literally doing when you're, when your physical condition is you're feeding your hunger. You're in varying stages of it, and you feed yourself according to the various stages. Now, Jesus said this, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, if if you're in your journey with Jesus, and you're frankly not feeling very hungry anymore, you have to question, honestly question, whether or not you're starving. You might, be feel, you might feel you're satisfied. Well, listen, Pastor Landon, I, I love Jesus. I, I go to church. Well, that's not happening right now. I love Jesus, but I go to church. I, I, you know, I, I, I basically do good things. And, and I'm good. I, I'm good with all of this. I, I don't feel like I need any more. If you're in the place where you no longer feel like you need more of God, you've actually shut yourself down and you're getting, you're starving. You need more. There's always more. In fact, that word says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they will be satisfied. That word actually means to gorge. It means to be in a large pasture and eat however much you want. Now listen, this is what happens to me at at different meals. My wife is an amazing cook. I love eating her, as as you you can tell. I love eating her cooking. And there are times where she makes dishes that are just my favorite and I wish I could keep eating. It's so delicious that I just want to keep eating. And so you know what I do? I, I keep eating. I, I, keep, I, <laughs> I keep eating and, and there comes a point where I'm just like, I'm so full because like, my body can't contain anymore. But here's the good news about King Jesus. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Your inner man was created to eat and eat and eat and eat. He is so good. You can continue to to learn from him, to grow in him, to experience him, to engage him. And you can keep eating and keep receiving from him. And there will always be room for more. Because your inner man was created to be able to receive continually from King Jesus. Listen, you might think that you know what you need to know. But knowledge in itself, if it isn't applied, has no power. Knowing doesn't mean that you're full. Application means that you're being full. Taking what you're learning. So some of you might might need to go back to some of the basic things and re-engage some of the basic elements of your faith. Some of you maybe are having to relearn what it is to pray. Rather than coming to church and having somebody pray on your behalf or simply pray for you, some of you are actually having to learn to dig into that and to learn to pray yourselves. Good, good. The whole purpose of this season that I can see God doing in the body of Christ right now is maturing us and drawing us into a greater revelation of who he is, who we are to him, and having a personal and intimate relationship with him so that we grow. It's important. It's powerful. It's necessary for you as a believer to fully engage this opportunity. Make this storm serve you. Come out of this a thousand times bigger in your inner man than you are on your outer man. Well, so how do, you, how do we do this? Well, what we do is we learn to feed our hunger. So we, the way we feed our hunger is by watching. First, start to watch. There's a scripture here that I'd like to share with you from Proverbs chapter 8, 34. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at, beside my doors. Watching daily at my gates. What does that mean? That word literally means keeping your eye out for what God is doing. Keeping your eye out for him. Looking for him. 
not just simply hoping that he would find you. So many times, Christians live in this way where they're like, Lord, where are you? Where are you? And they're actually not looking for him. They're just hoping to be found. I remember this one time, uh, Alyssa, our oldest, when she was just a little girl, she was laying under our deck outside, and Kathy and I were hearing this droning sound. something. And it, when we stopped to listen, we were hearing her say, I want a drink of water. She was just laying back saying, I want a drink of water. And so finally, Kathy, you know, reached out, yelled out the window, said, well, honey, come and get one. And she kind of went, oh, yes, I can do that. I can actually get something for myself. In the same way, so many of us are just hoping that God would, would come and find us in our brokenness when we can actually get up and watch for him. Jesus said, I only say what I hear my father saying. I only do what I see my father doing. What I see my father doing. He's paying attention to what God is doing. Are you paying attention to what God is doing? Are you watching for him? Because when you're watching for him, what will happen is the grace of, of the Lord and, the, and being plugged into the Holy Spirit, the anointing, that's what that really means, is being plugged into the Holy Spirit, that anointing of God will come over you and you'll see that God is wanting to heal somebody. You'll see that God is wanting to release his anointing or his grace over somebody so that they could be saved. You'll see these things and in seeing them, you'll respond and agree with what heaven is already saying is being done and coming into and making that happen. That's part of our role as believers. The second thing, we watch and we wait. Learn to wait on the Lord. It says this in Isaiah, and you've heard me say this, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, some of you aren't getting to do this right now. Maybe you have a home gym, but for those of you who, who like to go to the gym, you're not getting to do this. But if you were to lay under a bench press, if, if you know what that is, you lay on a bench and you, you push the weight out like this uh, on your back. And, and if, you know, if they were to put 500 pounds on that, it would come crashing down on me. But if I were to train, if I weight train, eventually I'll be able to manage that weight. So follow me here. Sometimes I have to train with weights to manage the weight of, of, of you know, of, of greater amounts of, of uh, resistance. In the same way, the Bible says that when you wait, W-A-I-T, on the Lord, you're able to grow in your strength. Here's the reason, is that there are weighty things that God wants to release to us, but because we haven't weight trained, W-A-I-T, because we haven't trained in waiting on God, we can't bear them. I remember one time uh, I was up at, when I was at, back at Eagle's Nest, I was up on Prayer Mountain and I was praying about an issue. Uh, we had an issue in our staff and I, I needed to pray it through and I needed to get wisdom. So what holy men do is they go to the mountain and they pray. And so I prayed for a few minutes saying, God, I, I need a strategy. I need you to, to pour something out for me. And, and so after about five minutes of prayer, I waited for another five minutes or so and I said, you know, hello, uh, Lord, Landon over here. I'm busy. I've got a lot of stuff going on. I, I've set this time aside. Uh, like, I, I need an answer. Well, half hour goes by. I don't hear anything. An hour goes by. I don't hear anything. I had set aside two hours. So an hour and 50 minutes had gone by. And I was starting to get a little frustrated. I'm like, hello, Lord, maybe something's going on in the Middle East or you're busy somewhere else. Uh, but I could really use some help here. And I've been waiting for you to show up. Finally, at, at five minutes before I had to leave, I, I said, fine, I've had it. I'm leaving. I'll figure something out myself. And I stood up to leave and I heard the Lord say to me, sit down. Like he used every syllable. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced, you know, especially for young uh, boys, uh, when your mother would use all of the syllables in a word, you knew you were kind of in trouble. And I heard the Lord say, sit down. And so I quietly sat back down and he said this, I'm sorry that your time has become so important to you. You can leave. And so I, I, I began to walk down back from my prayer place back to my office and, and this conviction of the Lord came over me. and I began to weep and I was like, God, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm so sorry. I, I, I kind of don't know what I've done. I, 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 I'm not sure what I've done. And when I got back to my office, I was sitting on my desk like this and I saw my watch. This is a nice watch. My daughter Amy gave me this watch. And, and, and it's, it's, it's now, it's, it's, it's a valuable possession, but it's, but it's not my most valuable possession, but it measures my most valuable possession, time. Time is my most valuable possession, and this measures it. 
And as I sat there and I saw my watch, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Landon, you can actually worship me with more than your time, or more than your, your, your words, more than your, your uh, 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 money. You can worship me with your time. You can give me your time. You can wait on me. And so the next day, slowly, quietly, I, I, I walked back up to, to my prayer spot. It was called Prayer Mountain. It was a beautiful spot. And as I sat down, I said this, Father, um, I have two hours, uh, and I need some answers. But here's the thing. These two hours, they belong to you. I'm going to lavishly give them to you. I'm worshiping you with my time. And I'm just going to wait on you. I might say a few things, but you don't need to say anything back. And I sat back, and in five minutes, nothing happened. 30 minutes, nothing happened. An hour and 50 minutes, nothing happened. And I stood up and I said, Lord Jesus, thank you for this amazing time in your presence. I love you. I honor you with my time, but I do need to get back down. And I'll trust you to give me a solution to this issue. And when I got up, I heard the Lord say, sit down. And in five minutes, he downloaded to me what would have taken years of life to learn. Why? Because in waiting on the Lord, I prepared my soul to begin to bear the weighty things from the Lord. Learn to wait on him. Watch for him and wait for him. This is how you feed your hunger. Now, Oh, I've heard it said, <laughs> I've heard it said this, that someday my ship will come in and with my luck I'll be at the airport. Um, I think a lot of times what happens is that we're not waiting uh, in the right place and we miss the point of our visitation. Oh, Jerusalem, if only you'd have known the things that make for peace. But they're, they're going past you because you missed the day of your visitation. Be found watching and waiting at his gates, not on Netflix. I'm not saying that you shouldn't use time to entertain yourself. I mean, there's times your kids are going to need entertainment. They're going to need a breather. I, I understand that you're going to need that too. And it's okay. But don't miss, your, don't miss when, when the goodness of God comes in because you were waiting in the wrong place or you were satisfying yourself in the wrong place. Learn to wait on the Lord and see his touch. Now, maybe you're visiting with us and this all seems, you know, a little, what do you mean wait on him? What does waiting on God look like? Well, it's actually fairly simple. Waiting on him looks like this. <laughs> it's waiting. It's sitting, letting your mind lean into him, asking him some questions without needing answers. Taking your Bible and just reading slowly, not reading to accomplish an amount. Don't read the Bible trying to accomplish an amount. Read the Bible with the purpose of connection. That's the beauty of connecting with the Lord that way. And just take your time and say, God, what are you saying to me in all of this? And if he says nothing, listen, this is, this is important news and engage this. God doesn't have to show up in, in, in these incredible ways every time. In fact, if you wait on purpose, if you realize, if God didn't come and, 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 and reveal something to you in that moment of waiting, rejoice. It must be big. You might need to train a little bit more. I remember there would be times I would go up to my prayer place and I would pray for two or three hours and nothing would happen. And, and I used to get frustrated until the Lord spoke to me. and He said, you're just not strong enough yet. Wait a little more. Wait a little more. Prepare your spirit a little bit more. And God in his grace will reveal to you things that would take years to understand. Listen, you've heard the phrase perhaps wisdom beyond their years. The way that you engage wisdom beyond your years is by waiting on the Lord. Because when you wait on him, you can manage the weighty things from him. Well, the third thing that I would submit, watch, wait, and worship. Look for your opportunities to worship the Lord. Now let's just look at this here. Pastor Amy read this earlier and I want to share it with you quickly. And it's out of uh, Luke 19, 40, where it says, and he answered, I'm telling you what, if these were silent, if these people stayed silent, the rocks around them would begin to cry out. Um, I think one of the most important elements of being a believer in Christ is learning how to worship the Lord. Why? Because the Bible says, magnify the Lord with me. When we worship God, we actually, we actually recognize and engage how much bigger he is than the things around us. We magnify him. 
and we become what we worship. We turn in, the Bible talks about how you become the things that you worship. And the more that you lean into worshiping the Lord, engaging him, and this is the value of this season. This is one way to force this storm to serve you profoundly. If you learn to engage an attitude, a posture, a lifestyle of worship, what you're doing is, first of all, number one, the Bible says that he's enthroned on the praises of his people. So another, word of, another way of saying that is that his address is worship. That's where, he, that's where he is. If you want to find him, start to worship. That's where he is. And if you want to bring his presence wherever you go, start to worship and you'll be walking and containing and, and living in the presence of God. And the purpose of this is to give us a heavenly focus to manage earthly stuff. You see that if you learn to engage heaven and focus on heaven and, love, and, and, and just be in love with Jesus, you begin to actually fall in love with the person of Christ, not necessarily the thing. And I want to encourage you to, to engage and, and, and push into, press into your personal worship. Now here's one way to, to, to take everyday things and turn them into an act of worship. Thanksgiving. If you, if, 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 you thank, if, you, if you become thankful for what God is doing in a moment, if, if, you, if you say, thank you, God, for, for what I'm doing right now with my hands, if you take what you're doing with your hands or, or any you know, relationships or things, just your everyday stuff, and just turn it, you, you turn it into an act of worship by being thankful. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, God, that, that, I'm, I, I, you know, that I'm able to do this with my hands. That I'm able to provide for my family with my hands this way. Thank you, God, for the grace of, of your presence. Thank you, God, for the way that you're helping me love my kids in this moment. So thanksgiving is the way to start that. Now, the word worship in the original language means to turn towards to kiss. The word is proskuneo. You would have heard it here often because we, we teach this. And if you're visiting us today, sometimes what we do is we, we look at the original language of what was written in the Bible. We try to find the Greek or the Hebrew word um, so that we understand some of the nuances behind it. And this, this is one of the elements. If it says worship, we immediately think a group of people gathering, lifting their hands and worshiping God, singing or praising. And yes, it is that. But at the same means to turn toward our attention with the intention of affection. Now, worship, this is important. Worship isn't simply the affection of God and, and us and God experiencing that affection. That's not what worship is. That's actually the result of worship. That's God's presence interacting with us. However, what it is is this. It's the actual turning, it's our choice. Worship is turning with an intention to express affection. It's that turning, turning towards to kiss. When I, when I come up to my wife and I put my arm around her and she turns towards me, she turns towards me for a kiss. That's the beauty of worship. It's our conscious choice to turn towards for affection and intimacy. That's what worship is. Don't miss your visitation by being affectionate somewhere else. Don't miss your, your visitation because God is wanting to visit. A couple of weeks ago, I shared about how Jesus showed up in the storm. Peter's most profound uh, experience with God was when Jesus was walking on the water in the midst of a storm. That's when he walked on the water and had this profound experience. God is wanting to release profound experiences for you in this season, in this storm. And this storm can serve you if you learn to feed your hunger. Because when you, when you taste and see that the Lord is good, it will open up something in your heart that will release you to even a greater measure of wanting more of Him. And church family, visitors, perhaps you're here today and you've never had the opportunity to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. All of you understand this. Once you come into a decision to follow Christ, it becomes, your, it becomes your responsibility to continue to feed your hunger so that you can find yourself in the place where you're consistently being filled, being satisfied, consistently engaging more of Him because He wants to release more of Himself to us as individuals in this season so that the greater release of the kingdom can, ha can happen when times come back to normal. 
if you've joined us today and, and you've never had the opportunity to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, it's very simple. You and I were created for relationship with God. You, were create, you and I were created to have intimacy with him. But because of sin, we lost that capacity to have, have relationship with him. And so what, what, what the God had decided is Jesus the Son came to the earth for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus came to the earth as a man and what he did was he lived a perfect life that we could never live and then died and went to the cross to take our sin, that sin that separates us from God. He took that upon himself on the cross and he died and then he overcame sin in the grave so that you and I could walk in freedom, in wholeness and experience the fullness of the nature of heaven. This is what he's done for us. Now, this is very, very important that you understand this. All you have to do to engage this wonderful love of God is to believe that Jesus died and that he rose again from the dead, that you would be saved. And if that's you today and you're saying, yes, I want to follow Jesus. I want to experience peace in this storm. I want to know the wonder of life. The Bible says, John 10, 10, life and life abundantly. I want my inside to be able to be bigger than my outside. I want to experience that. If that's you today, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me. Thank you that you died for me. I believe you died and rose again from the dead that I would be free, free from sin, free from shame, free to live fully with you and experience the wonder and the fullness of your nature and grace. So Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. Set me free from sin in the grave that I might walk with you and experience you. If you prayed that today, I want to invite you to email us at church at gatewayfamily.ca church at gatewayfamily.ca so that you can uh, have that opportunity to uh, engage us as family and walk together. Well, my phone has been buzzing. I think there might have been a couple of testimonies. So I'm going to hand it back over to uh, Amy and Devin here in just a moment. But remember this, the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you and give you peace. Remember you're the head and not the tail. Feed your hunger this week and make this storm serve you in Jesus name. God bless you.